right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. And today I'm delighted to welcome back Rachel Cipriano, who is in Florida. How are you doing, Rachel? I am doing fantastic. Absolutely. And Rachel is a CEO at Ma Magnificent Resilient. She's a speaker, advisor, coach, author, and leadership catalyst. And what we're going to talk about today is, uh, is a subject that uh, it's being talked about more, I would say, today than probably it has been in a while, but still, I think, at a kind of superficial level. And that is the impact of COVID on mental health uh, and particularly it, it, the, the thing about mental health, obviously, Rachel, is number one, it's not it's not always obvious or apparent to like, you know, if, if it's somebody in your organization or whatever, it's not really apparent or obvious to you from the get go. So I, I think there are a lot of people maybe assuming that, well, COVID's kind of gone, depending on where you are, because that might be an issue, too, if you kind of if you're you believe it's gone. Somebody else doesn't believe it's gone. All of that. Mm -hmm. But we because it's receded, we probably assume that the mental health impacts have receded, which obviously isn't the case. What do you say? No, absolutely not. Um, I, I just wanted to share basically the um, from the get go back in March of 2020, when it kind of exploded on the scene. I was very concerned with some of the language that was being used, for instance, physical distancing. I would have, I mean, excuse me, social distancing. Mm -hmm. I would have much preferred to hear physical distancing being used because one of the aspects of my seminars that I emphasize so clearly and the book I'm writing, et cetera, is that human connection is the oxygen of resilience. And when you really understand that premise, you can imagine right out of the gate when we look at the last two years, how we could end up with residual mental health effects from all of the isolation, the inability for people to attend important events, such as weddings, graduations, funerals, see their loved ones in nursing homes, mm -hmm. et cetera. The fallout is uh, quite considerable, including on the very young population as well. Yeah, yeah, and uh, absolutely. And if you think about it, um, for you know, for some people, then the maybe who had been in office and then went remote and all of that. For some people, maybe it it worked out okay, got to connect with their children more, whatever. But there's other populations, too, who that isolation, not being in an office, not being in a social environment, as you say, um, and especially, I mean, I would say especially for a lot of younger people, because those are kind of formative, you, you know, your early years of your career, that the social aspect tends to be as important, if not sometimes more important <laughs> than the job itself. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, the very young population, you know, when you were talking about infants, toddlers, preschoolers, those are very critical periods of development um, where they need to be able to be free to play and to read people's faces. That's how they learn a lot about the world and who's safe and who's not. And, and again, as I said, these are critical periods. So if they're missed, it will have an impact on their development. So now we have to look to see how can we mitigate those effects, as well as for the school age children who spent, you know, depending upon where they lived and the policies mm -hmm. enacted in their particular city or state or what have you, what kind of effects are these children dealing with from the isolation? And it's it's quite considerable. And we're seeing it in very, you know, very high depression, anxiety, stress rates, sadly, in some cases, suicide. Mm -hmm. So this really needs, as you said, deeper attention, not just some superficial discussion, but this itself is a major health issue that I believe needs our definite uh, attention 
and real practical solutions of how to mitigate those effects. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. And I think that, uh, that uh, you know, as you said, I mean, there are these big issues that I don't think are being looked at enough. I mean, you just mentioned something really interesting. Here's a, here's a, here's a kind of strange paradox, right? When we, were, when we were growing up, you would have said, person wearing mask, bad person not wearing a mask, at least you, you know, know that they may be okay. Now we told children, person without mask, bad person with mask is good. Like, so what a confusing <laughs> messages we've been sending to, to our kids. Um, Right. But it, but it, and I, I mean that's I'm being a little bit trite there, but the the reality is that we've sent so many kind of strange and contradicting messages to our children and to young people and even to ourselves, and that that the, that it stands to reason that we would have a hard time coping with all of this or even intellectually consuming all of this as as mature adults. My goodness, as young people, as children, what chance do they have? Oh, for sure. And I'd like to address that as well, because I think it's very important to this discussion that when you're looking at issues such as the mask versus no yeah. mask and the different perception people have of that, along with the V word, the vaccine, mm -hmm. um, that has created a lot of division between people. Yep. And again, when we're talking about human connection being the oxygen of resilience. I mean, this has created division between family, between friends, and that has a serious impact on individual and society's mental health. And so if we're looking at solutions of how we can address and mitigate these effects, I think it's important to consider strategies to help people understand how important those family connections are and their other social relationships. And the reason it's worth it to sometimes just say, hey, we can agree to disagree, mm -hmm. but it's not worth sacrificing these essential connections for our mental health as well as our physical health. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree with that. And I think that what has gotten lost is, well, they always say that the problem with common sense is it's not that common. So whatever common sense we had, a lot of it went out the went out the window because we have got to get back to looking at what are the things that we have in common or what are the things that we can agree upon instead of this, it seems this societal fixation on identifying the things that we disagree on, identifying where we have divergent opinions. And it becomes this, as you said, I mean, we're, we're isolating into like these dog groups of ideological dogma, depending on where you are on, on, on the political spectrum. It doesn't matter which side you're on. It's everybody is capable of getting caught up in these, I would say, you know, these cocoons of dogmatic cocoons. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, we have become so incredibly polarized for various reasons, mm -hmm. but definitely this whole last two years has played a significant role. And like I said, if we are going to address these issues, because what adults are doing and what families are doing and what friends are doing, that has an impact on the children. They're experiencing mm -hmm. that if they're no longer seeing aunties and uncles or cousins because of these divisions that, you know, if we can step back and really, like I said, have the education of how much this plays into people's overall well-being and mental health, hopefully that will help people rise above and have that maturity to be okay with the differences. And like you said, focus on the commonalities and what can bring us together as human beings. Um, yeah, yeah, because I mean, I, I feel to some degree that we have, we have lost the art of, of, um, what's, what, what's the word I'm looking for, but it's, it's like the perspectives we have or, or everything today is like everything is raised to the level of yes, it's so important that you and I are going to fall out over this, right? There's no, there's no proportionality to it. There's no looking at well, actually, in the greater scheme of things, that the thing that you and I disagree on is 
not that important to the overall relationship or to the overall well-being of, of those around us. But we've lost that sense of proportion. It's where everything rises to that level. And that's the part we've got to get away from. I absolutely agree. And this whole issue kind of always brings me back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. if we're looking at the bottom of the pyramid, that's where we think of our survival and our security. And I think that's where so many people were. They were afraid of dying from this virus mm -hmm. and experience. And they did lose loved ones and they had reasons for their fears. And, um, you know, sometimes when you're so focused on just survival mode, you're not up there recognizing how much the love and belonging mode are mm -hmm. important as well. And I really think that there was so much emphasis given to this virus. Other health issues were kind of put on the yeah. back seat. And I, I believe that could have made a huge difference if we kind of held that whole picture, if the health professionals had done that. But be that as it may, where, where we're at now, and, you know, I just want to come on here and I thank you for this opportunity to discuss practical solutions mm -hmm. and mitigation, um, you know, mechanisms, because it is absolutely critical for all of us as we move forward. So let me ask you a couple of questions here. So if I'm if I'm say running an organization or I'm managing a, a department or a team, how do how can I start as a leader to make sure that I am creating the best environment possible, but also that I am recognizing when issues crop up and also probably recognizing that there may be some serious divisions within the team at different levels over things that are external to the company. But let's face it, it all bleeds in at the end of the day. Absolutely. I think, you know, with so many companies playing catch up and, you know, just trying to stay competitive at the time when the economy isn't in the strongest spot it's ever mm -hmm. been in, let's face it, it can't be underestimated that Team building is a very important aspect of having the productivity ultimately the shareholders mm -hmm. are looking for. You know, if there isn't that connection between your team and those healthy relationships, the productivity is absolutely going to suffer. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not saying a supervisor as a mental health coach or what have you, but some of this is just common sense. And for example, I just went to a meeting the other day, a meeting that of an organization that's just getting off the ground. And I was kind of um, disappointed to see that the leader of that organization just wanted to get right down to business and didn't seem to stop to consider if this group was going to come together and be effective, mm -hmm. there needed to be some time for some networking and building of those relationships and connections. So that just sometimes doesn't actually get the attention it really needs. And mm -hmm. um, that's something for anyone listening to this who is in that position of build, you know, building your department or what have you, please don't neglect the importance of giving your uh, team the opportunity to build those bonds and connections because it will pay off in literal dividends. Yeah. And and to remind them that life is about you. Know, you will work beside, interact with people who you may fundamentally disagree with 50 percent of their thoughts but 50 percent, the other 50 percent, they're like good human beings they're doing their best uh, they're working hard they're an asset to the organization so you have to learn somehow to be able to park the other 55 percent or 50 percent and focus on how you can work together that's i i think that's a piece that needs to be addressed uh you know particularly post pandemic Oh, I couldn't agree more. And I'm glad that you brought that aspect of the situation up because I think we 
know anyone who's uh, been in the business world for any length of time, then not everybody that we come across is necessarily going to be our best friend. We're going to have the most in common with. Mm -hmm. But if we work on building that mutual respect, and as you mentioned earlier, making sure to kind of focus on the commonalities, emphasizing the mission, emphasizing the core values, then we can come together and work effectively as a team. But without those kinds of uh, intentional values, especially in the climate we find ourselves in that is so polarized, absolutely, an organization can be derailed by you know, differences as a result of, you know, social issues or other political issues, et cetera. And so focusing on healthy disagreement, agreeing to disagree, et cetera, you know, can really pay off, as I've said, in just creating a healthier workspace. And I believe it always starts with the leader, you know, mm -hmm. what tone are they setting? What, you know, they need to be looking at not just, like I said, the company's bottom, bottom line, but are they taking care of their own physical, mental, and emotional health as well? Because that's going to have a tremendous effect on the team. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, and I agree with that. I'm glad you mentioned the physical too, because I do think it's it's um, you know mind, body, physical, mental. It all goes together. Um, so that's critical that people look after themselves physically as well. I mean, during the pandemic, it seems to have gone one of two ways. Either people kicked into gear and suddenly were exercising and building their home gyms and going running every day, or they were Netflix binging <laughs> on the couch. So uh, whichever. So, I mean, I think the encouragement to, to, for the, you know, to get physically fit and stuff is, is a good one too. Cause I think you can't be mentally fit without being physically fit. I just don't think they go they go hand in hand. So what what advice would you have to maybe somebody who is struggling with the return to work, uh, struggling with re-engaging, struggling you know, that because of the isolation, maybe that, you know, they feel differently about things, they feel differently about this. How would you how would you advise somebody who just is struggling with the whole coming back to whatever it is we're coming back to? Right. Well, I think what I always emphasize is the importance of raising your level of consciousness and your awareness, your intentionality. Unless you're a dive-in-the-wool extrovert, mm -hmm. a lot of times people can just, especially if they're more introverted, they could become very comfortable, you know, just kind of shrinking back and maybe they don't realize how important mm. it is even to their health to have some engagement. I know they also need time to themselves, sure. but too much time is not healthy. And so, you know, sometimes we have to do, you know, make those steps to join an organization or get involved in something social within our company or whatever it takes, you know, we have to do it kind of afraid or when we're still uncomfortable right. recognizing that there's a there's a long range benefit that's going to come. All right. So thank you for watching and listening. Thank you to Rachel. Uh, all of Rachel's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, Rachel, do please tell people a little bit more about the work you do. Absolutely. Uh, basically, I'm a professional speaker, trainer, coach, and I'm writing a book Trauma and Resilience, Five Secrets to Becoming Stronger in the Broken Places. I can be found at rachelcipriano.com. And I also have a YouTube channel with the same name, which has some uh, co good content on it that can help you with your personal and professional goals, as well as just your overall well-being, having greater resilience, success, and significance. Yeah, listen, thanks, Rachel. And I would encourage everybody to to check it out and to check out the book when it comes out, because I think you're going to be, unfortunately, and maybe it's not unfortunate, because maybe we needed to shine a light on this anyway. 
um, I think we're going to be hearing and a lot more about mental health and understanding mental health issues a lot more as we go forward. And that's got to be a good thing. Absolutely. For sure. All right. well, thank you so much, John. I really appreciate your time. Yeah. And thank you for watching and listening. I'll see you all again soon. Thank you.